Welcome to Biblical Insights with David Gooding, a Myrtlefield House podcast. When we study scripture, we ask two basic questions. What does it say? Why does it say it? What I'm doing, therefore, is looking for what I would call the thought flow. This is not just a philosophical theory. There's gospel actually works. Let me tell God what I think of God. Let God pay all so long as God be mine. Paul's epistle to the Colossians reminds us that ultimately Christ is all we need. He is our initial salvation, our growth and sanctification, and our final glorification. Studying Colossians reminds us of our status as God's children, showing us how to walk with Christ while avoiding the enemy's pitfalls. In this episode, David Gooding reminds us of the privilege of being made in God's image, and that as such, our lives are to be in line with God's word by loving and forgiving others, just as he loves and forgives us. There are some, of course, they don't mean to do it, but some uh, preachers that discourage their audiences, and I doubtless have been guilty of it myself, and have given the impression that you've only got to devote yourself today, and all the opposite forces of sin will be pushed down tomorrow. It isn't true, is it? Let me remind you of a biblical analogy. When Joshua brought the people of Israel over the Jordan to face Jericho, how do you read the story? Why you say they had a prayer meeting? They claimed victory and the walls of Jericho fell down at once. Well, you have a different Bible then. No, they didn't. The first day they went round the walls of Jericho and when they got back at night, the walls were still there. And the next day they um, went round the walls of Jericho and came back again. The walls were still there, weren't they? You say, yes, the wretched folks, they didn't have enough faith. No. God didn't tell them the walls would come down the first day, nor the second day, nor the third day. In fact, God left the walls in place six days. And it was only on the seventh they came down. Why do you suppose he left them there six days? Well, I don't know. I've no verse for it. But I imagine if you'd have been an Israelite and had to walk round the walls of Jericho six days uh, on end and look at those horrible bearded enemies over the, uh, over the walls, by the end of the sixth day, you would have hated those walls. Ha! Huh. Yes. And sometimes God makes us march around the uglinesses of our personality, doesn't he? and how we wish they would go. Thank God for the hatred of sin that God thereby builds into our personality. You'll be all the safer for eternity in heaven, my friend, for the hatred of sin that God works into your heart. As in faith of him, you continue the battle, and unresistingly and uncompromisingly are determined with God to see it through to the end. Two groups of sins, perverse desire and perverted hostility. If one wants to sum them up under general heads, of course, the first one has to do with love gone wrong, doesn't it? Love is a very good thing. How terribly it has been perverted in the human personality and in the world, I've no need to remind you. We are to let the risen Christ purify our love. And as we pass by, let us notice that along with the sins, a so-called sins of the flesh that come from a perverted desire, is catalogued covetousness. That impeccable Christian businessman could be guilty of a sin, couldn't he? that should be bracketed with those other sins. Loving, loving thing, more than loving God. We need to watch our affections, therefore, our love. And we need to guard our hatreds. Not all hatred is wrong, is it? Writing to the church at Ephesus on an occasion our Lord Jesus says, very well done, you hate the things I hate. So hatred is a positively healthy thing. 
And if we would be healthy, we too have to learn to develop our hatred, our hatred of all that is evil and sinful, of course. But hatred can go wrong, can't it? And we have to watch ourselves. There is such a thing very well known to reviewers of theological books called Odium Theologicum, the hatred that theologians uh, indulge in. You should listen to them reviewing other people's books. Mm, as far as they know, they're concerned simply for the truth. But in their campaign for the truth, sometimes other people would discern a lot of pride and self-will and goodness knows what. So that if we're not careful, we stand for the truth of God with a spirit that is utterly fleshly. And sometimes with a hatred that is inspired, says James, of hell. We have to watch our hatred as well as our love. And then, of course, the reasons. God's wrath and God's image. We need to notice very carefully what, in fact, Colossians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7 say. They're not saying that if a believer misbehaves, he will suffer God's wrath eternally. It is saying that God's wrath comes on the sons of disobedience for these things. Therefore, if you are a believer, you mustn't go on doing those things. Why not? Well, pray consider God's feeling about it. God's wrath comes upon those things. Once you lived in them, not now. If you are considering what pleases the Lord and what displeases Him, that, after all, has got to be, isn't it, our chief motivation? Is what I am doing, does it please the Lord? Not positively, how far may I go, but uh, positively, will it please the Lord? Or will it offend Him? And secondly, and I need not stress it further, the question of God's image. We're meant to represent God, aren't we? To express God. It's not merely what could I get away with and God not take steps against me. It's, but I have been given the supreme honour of being the image of God. Man originally made and put into the Garden of Eden was made in the image of God, wasn't he? And what a high order of office that was to be the very viceroy of God, to be in God's place and organize this world and subdue it and make something of it as God's viceroy, God's representative, made in the image of God to have dominion. The wonder is that when mankind rebelled against God, he didn't destroy them, but has offered them a redemption and not only reinstated us and put us in another Garden of Eden, but infinitely higher than that, has joined us to his Son, and we're seated with his Son in heavenly places, far above all principalities, powers, mights, and dominions. And we, along with the Lord Jesus, have to be the image of God in redemption, the Queen to Jesus the King. Why we must judge angels, so it says, we must judge the world one of these days. God's representative made in the image of God. I know it's difficult to remember it, isn't it? When you've lived all your life as a spiritual pauper. Difficult to remember as you go out on Monday, isn't it? That you are, in fact, joined with the risen Lord, made in the image of God. And as I said earlier, it comes down to practical things. Don't lie to one another. For you see this new man that you have put on. In it there cannot be Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bondman or freeman. But Christ is all and in all. Notice that list of things. 
You will notice that in this particular list, it's not to be confused with other lists. It doesn't say here that there's not um, male or female, of course there is. But certain distinctions here go, don't they? Religious and ethnic. Greek and Jew, ethnic. Circumcision and uncircumcision, religious. Barbarian, Scythian, bondmen and free men are social, aren't they? The Greeks, you know, regarded anybody who couldn't speak Greek as a barbarian. So even if it were a very learned Cicero, the Greek held him to be a barbarian, though he were talking Latin and was saying very learned. He wasn't Greek, that's all. Well, then there were other, of course, foreigners to the Greek mind. There were Scythians. They came from the edge of the world, where if you went a few inches further, you dropped over the side of it. And by definition, you'll see, they were impossible savages and uncouth Scythians. And then there were the social levels within their city. There were slaves as distinct from freemen. And, uh, of course, the distinction was kept up. They wore different clothes and so on. Yes, but in Christ, those distinctions disappear, don't they? Believe it or not, underneath the uncouth and broken hysteria is that new man, which is Christ, and Christ is all. And in all, we shouldn't be having ideas, should we now, anymore? Oh, well, he's a southerner and he's a northerner, should we? He's a Jew and he's an Arab. It's in Christ. The blessed Lord of glory is in him and in her. Yes, and then there are practical duties that are positive. There has to be God-like and Christ-like love. There should be the rule of Christ's peace within our heart. We are to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. You'll see, there is to be God-like love. Consider, says Paul, your status. Put on, therefore, verse 12, as God's elect, holy and beloved, beloved of God, his chosen people, and holy. Do remember your status. You are never given permission to get away from your position of holy and elect and beloved of God. And if you've been beloved of God, then says Paul, we must show that kind of love in our hearts. And not only loved of God, but loved of the Lord who forgave us. We are to forgive as he forgave. He didn't forgive you before you repented, did he? He was prepared to forgive you. He put up with you. He bore with you. And we're to do the same long-suffering, forbearing one another, we are to forgive as Christ forgave us the moment the offender repents to forgive. And let the peace of Christ rule, not just our own subjective state and enjoyment of peace, but the Lord's peace. And Christ has established peace through his reconciliation and joined his people together in one body, and the old enmity is gone. Don't let me start and break the peace. So in all the decisions that I must take, I must have that in mind, mustn't I? I must work for peace. Doesn't mean that I shall compromise with evil and peace at any price. My motivation must be to keep and preserve and to foster the king's peace and the peace of the body of Christ. And do be thankful, says Paul. Isn't it tremendous how easily we forget to be thankful and are full of criticism? Oh, let's learn to be thankful. It pertains to our psychological health, not only to the absence of hostility, but peace in the sense of wholeness. 
to be full of thanksgiving and to dwell on the healthy, holy, wholesome things that make for peace and wholeness. And let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. My brothers, my sisters, we need to take it seriously, don't we? My old granny knew her book had she had more time to read it. More, I think, than sometimes in our modern generation knows it. We must be careful of talking of Holy Scripture as though it was sometimes a little unspiritual to know too much about it. It's the word of the Lord, isn't it? You can't soak yourself too much in it. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. How do you suppose you'll come to see the wonderful things Shakespeare is saying? If all you read of Shakespeare is a potted edition for, for two minutes each day and the odd talk on a radio, you understand the heart of Shakespeare, you must soak yourself in Shakespeare. If you want to know about computers, you'll have to soak yourself in computers. If you want to know what God thinks, you'll have to soak yourself in his word, won't you? Let it dwell in you rich. Oh, let me have every hobby under the sun. But my friend, let's ask, do I know more about my hobby than I do about the word of the Lord Jesus? And if the word of Christ dwells in us richly, it will do lovely things, won't it, to us? Able to admonish one another, of course, in all wisdom, singing, whether to ourselves or delightfully, singing in our hearts to the Lord. And when you remember what this epistle has been about, how once we were enemies and Satan has got us in the dark and persuaded us that God was a terrible old tyrant and an absolute wet blanket and a bore. And that's the worst accusation our modern generation could hurl at God, isn't it? That he's a bore. How Satan must gnash his teeth when he hears you going around singing to the Lord in your heart. Oh, what a lovely thing. And if you've got the rheumatism or something or lie ill in bed, that you can still sing to the Lord why that Satan and all his hosts and his slanders defeated already, isn't he? Singing to the Lord, supreme commander, because you love him and admire his wisdom and his rule. And do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, I'm never to act upon my own authority. But I shall have to be careful here, shall I not? Terrible things have been done in the name of the Lord. If I'm going to fulfill my responsibility and privilege of acting in the name of the Lord, then doubly do I need to let the word of Christ dwell in me richly, so that when I act in the name of the Lord, my action shall be according to and in line with his word. Thank you for listening to Biblical Insights with David Gooding. If you're interested in more of Dr. Gidding's teachings, check out our other podcast series or visit our website, myrtlefieldhouse.com, for free ebooks, sermons, and study notes.